Leeds, Leeds, Leeds. What is happening? Welcome to Working Hours. My name is Simon Treen and I want to ask 1,000 loiners, that's people in Leeds or from Leeds, over this decade, the second question that everybody asks everybody. What do you do? So, if you're in Leeds or from Leeds, then be my guest, Leeds. Email workinghourspod at western-studios.com with a short bio and some ideas about your availability. You can appear as yourself or anonymously on the show and you will have approval over what gets published from our chat. Welcome to episode 12. So, this is the second episode of the second series of the show. My guest today is an anonymous male and this interview was recorded over Skype on the 2nd of February 2021. My guest on this episode previously worked for 20 years as a stockbroker. Through a personal project of trying to maximise what he could achieve within a lunch hour while he was working in that stockbroker role, he has found himself working within the area of work-based well-being now. We discuss a number of topics from my guest time as a stockbroker, looking at some of the myriad things he was able to achieve within those lunch hours, and we discuss some of his thinking around ways that we might raise awareness of well-being at work, and also how we might perhaps embed some well-being practices into our workplaces and our ways of working. We chatted for a good while during this interview, and some bonus material will be made available to anyone who'd like to support this project and help it to develop. I will talk more about what my goals are for the show as we progress. This is something that I should have been doing since the beginning, but that's all part of my learning process. First, I wanted the show to exist, which I feel it does now. Next for me is refinement. I want to finesse what is now there. I want to improve my presenting and the show's production values. And most importantly, I want to get myself in front of the loiners who are game for being my guests. So before we get into this episode, just a quick call out. I need guests, guests, guests. Leeds, I really need to get representation from BAME workers, LGBTQI plus workers and workers with disabilities who are either in Leeds or from Leeds. If you know someone who fits that bill, then please get them to email me. I do need every source of loiner, so even if you're a loiner who can't and doesn't work, I would still be very interested to hear about how you think about work. I would still love to hear what you think work is and what you think work is for. Okay, so that's the intro. Let's get into the episode. What did you want to be when you grew up? What did it, that's a great question. Well, my parents tell me that I wanted to be a tractor when I was about four. And then <laughs> I remember wanting to be a stuntman yeah. about 10. I think that's because I had an evil Knievel wind up motorbike. Yeah. That was my only qualification for being a stuntman. And then I was getting into art and stuff. I wanted to be maybe a graphic designer or a furniture designer, something like that. Mm-hmm. I never became any of those, but that was. <laughs> That was what I fancied. So what do you do now? So now my job title is Wellbeing Information Coordinator. And I work okay. for a local council, a local authority. So that, yeah, at the moment that involves me sitting in my spare room in Leeds, which is not, it's for a council outside Leeds. But um, so I'm, I'm working online, on Zoom, on the phone. And I've not actually been into the um, the office because I started on 31st of July. Right. So I've met a couple of people in real life. Yeah. From who I work with, but that's about it. Did you interview remotely as well then? Yeah. Yeah, I interviewed yeah. remotely. Um, so that was... So previous to that, I'd worked in a, one job for 20 years. And I right. I hate you. I hate interviews, I'm, you know, like most people, yeah. I guess. Yeah. Um, I've, uh, yeah, I, I got help with having interviews and stuff because I just, I don't think I've, I'd ever had a, got a job through having an interview previously. Right. So yeah. it was the first time. Uh, but it was a job I really wanted. I think it's the first time I've ever had an interview for a job that I actually really wanted as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It was, I mean, that doesn't half help you. Yeah. Uh, motivation and stuff so yeah I was cock a hoop but it's a, it's a contract it's it ends in March but I'm hoping it will get extended because yeah cause I believe in it you know I believe in in the job and um so what what does that kind of entail then are you is your well-being focus sort of internal external or both 
Right, it's external. I'm part of the adult social care team, mm -hmm. and it, it's it's providing information to the city in line with the Care Act 2014, which means that basically the Care Act uh, was about giving people the what they needed in order to be able to make their own decisions rather than it being a top-down sort of thing. Yeah. So it's about having information about care mental health etc and it being in a accessible format and clear and accurate yeah it's part of a wider partnership of mm -hmm. very like the nhs ccg and various other organizations including libraries etc who all feed into this platform yeah and it's keeping it it's keeping it up to date maintaining it and mm -hmm. Uh, working on the relationships with those partners okay so you said platform there are you, is it like web-based or app -based yeah or anything? You're right. it's totally web-based it's a, it's yeah. an online notice board it's, it's an online community notice board is the easiest way to describe it so it's um you know there's not a team of people behind it mm -hmm. well there is a, there's a there's loads of people behind it but you can't ring up and say help me it's a yeah. it's a you know, it's an online thing. It's about social workers use it, GPs use it, social prescribers use it. What would that so, be? So it's for everyone. What's a social um, prescriber? So a social prescriber is someone who will... So a GP might say to a um, customer, what do you call people who go... Service users? Service user, yeah. Um, <laughs> Or a person, they might say, yeah. you could do with joining a, a community group. Right. And it, it might refer them to a social prescribing service who then might look on the directories on this website and say, right. this is near you. This is near you. Um, you know, I'll contact them on your behalf. Or, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a good and interesting concept, but it's got its flaws, i.e., when a pandemic comes across. Mm. You know, there there are no activities. Uh, you know, there's very little face-to-face -face stuff, but there is online stuff, which is mm. can be a godsend, but it can also, you know, exclude some people. Does this have anything to do with the loneliness minister and so on? Yeah, I mean, that that's a, there's a section on there about loneliness and social isolation. Yeah. Um, which is a, you know, it was an issue, a growing issue before COVID, mm -hmm. but now. I was talking to someone earlier today and, you know, we we're in agreement that we're all, you know, we're all socially isolated, isolated yeah. uh, and possibly lonely. Um, so it's something we can all maybe relate to and hopefully do something about. You know, one of my things is, you know, why is anyone socially isolated in this day and age? And that's a really interesting question in itself. But... It's quite easy to see how it can happen, especially at the moment. I don't know about you, but for me, this lockdown, so I remember the first lockdown, there was a lot of activity on social. There was like, you know, lots of messages being kind of WhatsApped around and video calls and things going on. Like people yeah. were in touch quite a lot. The second one, people were kind of, you know, they'd send you a message. This mm -hmm. one is kind of like people have just not bothered kind of like yeah. you know uh, we'll just wait you know it's like we're, we're just waiting out the darkness until spring <laughs> yeah like, yeah oh, hopefully the pubs will be open then and we can go out i know <laughs> can you imagine that can you imagine i was reading about the isle of man yesterday they, they've lifted all their restrictions and there was you know a guy interviewed who had gone to the pub <laughs> that was in the national paper <laughs> right what a great interview. It was brilliant. <laughs> I think as well, I was saying this to, to a friend yesterday, um, that there's that element of, you know, you, you're going to reach the point in the conversation where you're like, how's everything going? Oh, well, I've not been doing much. And then how are you coping with this? And it's kind of like, I'm sick of it. Yeah. You know, there's not really much, many directions for that conversation to go. It's kind of a... It's like a mm. conversation you don't need to have. Yeah. So I think a lot of people are just not bothering. <laughs> so it's quite weird because when you do get in touch with people, they're like, oh, you know, it's good to hear from someone. 
like why 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 are we bothering less i'm not quite sure i don't know if everyone is but that's certainly my experience yeah no i've, I've heard similar i've heard uh, i was in a meeting yesterday and we were talking about that you know it was it was a novelty wasn't it it, it was an awful novelty but it was a novelty mm. at the start nothing I, I found it quite surreal at the yeah. start when, when the first pandemic started i was i wasn't in this job i was looking for work and it was sunny wasn't it god it was hot yeah yeah um and you know it was an awful you know it's an awful thing to happen but um it was a novelty and now it's just not a novelty anymore and it's it's not going away yeah at the moment you know fingers crossed but i think at the start it would, people were like oh it might last a couple of weeks or something but it's not only not going away it's going to have ramifications you know it's, there's there's issues that may well come out of it as we're hearing you know mental health issues etc and mm. general health issues mm. um, and and like social issues beyond in terms of you know i wouldn't like to be in commercial property at the moment I, yeah they're, they're going to have a huge downsize and like people will naturally downsize spaces i mean would you know and plus all the businesses going out of business yeah um i mean we because we're you know we're doing better than other places in in some regards mm. but you know there'll still be fallout but then there'll be bounce back as well to a degree i suppose and, and there'll be changes I, I mean another thing i was saying recently was there'll, there'll be a lot of ink printed about you know the long-term effects and ramifications of this to all of us and so on and then there'll be a load of ink spilt about oh that wasn't really a thing it didn't really affect anyone you know they'll over egg it and then they'll under egg it so it's just like it will have a lot of long-term effects to people like i don't know if this is going to have long-term effects to me but it's definitely something that i will remember and it's definitely something that's had an effect on me you know yeah even though it didn't really change my circumstances massively it's mm -hmm. still the it's still that sort of you can't go out and you can't do that and you know, having all those avenues of, of options taken away and shut down. Yeah. You can't just go see someone. Like, you can mm. ring someone, but it's not, it's not the same. Yeah, it's definitely, you know, for all the good that doing Zoom calls and FaceTime, et cetera, mm. it's not quite the same, is it? But, yeah, I mean, yeah, obviously, things like this have happened in the past, you know, you know, pandemics, et cetera. I wonder, you know, there was a cholera outbreak in Leeds in the 1830s. You know, they didn't have Zoom. How did they get on? You know, I I, you know, if if they had COVID, then mm. I don't know what would have happened. <laughs> Obviously, it's pointless thinking about it, really, but it's all relative, I suppose. But you no, know, thank God we've got Zoom because we we can't. If you go if you go near someone, you're in danger of either catching it or passing it on. Aren't you? Yeah, yeah. It's uh, I, and and it's nice to have that extra option. I mean, like I said, the first lockdown, everyone seems to be going crazy with it. Yeah. And, you know, like I'm I'm living with my folks, so right. um, they you know it was like they discovered video chat. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and sort of. And and sharing little videos and stuff. So it seems like everybody was was just you know ringing each other constantly. I rang loads of people that I've not been in touch with for ages. Yeah, I've got in touch with people. I'm sure a lot of other people kind of did that because yeah. you 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 went like I went up and down in terms of uh, you know it doesn't affect anything. It's not really changing anything for me to like this could be the end. Everything could fall apart. So yeah. it was a bit of an up and down kind of roller coaster of things, but now it's just like, oh, when does it end? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's become people that phrase the new normal, but mm. even that was more exciting than this. This is just normal now, isn't it? <laughs> Not even new. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the shine's gone off it already. <laughs> Let's go a little bit back more to your work then. So, what have you? What have you? been able to do during this time has it reduced loads and loads of your options in terms of what you i mean in terms of what you can do obviously but 
is there other stuff that is coming in that can replace those have you got other things starting in terms of online pub quizzes or whatever that you can refer people to there is i mean there's things like mind you know mind the mental health charity they do in the in the city i work in they do a a program of health and well-being stuff there's there's about 50 activities i think we've got listed that are i think they're all online but they're, they're all you know community groups or charities that are putting on things they were probably putting on stuff before that was face to face yeah but getting more online stuff but it, it did really it dropped off to almost nothing you know from being hundreds of things that were going on yeah and you know there's various reasons the organizers are concerned because they don't they've got issues with risk etc you know ppe and knowing what's right and wrong to do you know no one wants to go out and mingle well some mm. people do but they shouldn't be <laughs> you know just things like physical health people's physical health you know maybe people who are isolated or old mm. old age who might have been able to go out by themselves you know been inside for a, nearly a year maybe now yeah well quite probably you know in the whole year because there was there was people when lockdowns ended that you know they were still at risk they were sheltering that they, they weren't coming out of lockdown were they so yeah. some of those people will have just been been in more than a year as well because well coming up to a year isn't it but some people were starting to have to isolate before we actually started getting to the point of lockdown weren't they so they were yeah. kind of saying to people you've got to stay home so i remember kind of hearing all of those before we went into lockdown all right let's do a little bit about your other work first and then we'll come back to this job if that's all right yeah yeah to do that so yeah. you what were you doing before this okay so before this i had about two years where i was doing it was kind of kind of like a pre-retirement pre-retirement i think the trendy right. people call it and before that i worked in an office job for 20 years in leeds city center right and yeah 20 years of that i decided it was more than enough yeah. <laughs> and, uh, so i resigned from that job without knowing what i was going to do really right gave myself a bit of a shock to the system you know two years later i was doing this job which is great i'm really pleased that i got that job yeah it's very different yeah but there are some similarities you know that's one one of the concerns i had was transferable skills yeah yeah you know what i'd been in a job for 20 years you know there's this term about working in silos mm -hmm. i i was actually a silo myself you know i i felt like um, you know, I've been doing that so long. I didn't have the skills or at least the um, the know-how to talk about any skills I might have. Right, yeah, um, yeah. Because it all seems so specific to your role that it's kind of like, well, I, I don't know how you would use this elsewhere because this is how I yeah. use it. Yeah, unless I was doing exactly the same thing somewhere else. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, but I've, what I've realised now is that some of those skills that uh, are used in a totally different role are good in this role, you know, and that involves simple things like picking up the phone and talking to people, you know, that is a, that is a dying skill. I think, you know, having face to face conversations and, you know, rather than emailing. Yeah. If you can do that, you, you've got one up on a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I, I mean, I, and it's far more effective. I mean, half the time people don't read emails anyway. Well, most of the time, people don't read emails. You sort of scan the yeah. subject and the body. And I, I know from spending, you know, I've literally sometimes spent hours composing emails to put all the information in. So it's all there. It's all clear, simple, mm. concise, but it's all all there. And then you send it out. And then it's like everyone asks you loads of questions about it. It's like, didn't you read my email? No, nobody reads yeah. emails. <laughs> yeah. I think emails are more for the sender than the recipient. You know? yeah, oh, yeah, absolutely. It, it's so that you can say you did the thing. It's like, have you asked so-and-so yeah. about that? Yes, I sent them an email. Yeah. <laughs> there is an audit trail of me doing the thing. Yeah. So, I've, but it I've didn't done. really get done because they didn't read it. Yeah. 
Yeah, that was so. In the previous job I had, which was um, it was in a stockbroker's in town. So I, I started that job in 1997. Mm. I was only meant to be there for two or three weeks or something. Filing, a friend got me the job because I, I was looking for work at the time. So it was a temporary job. When I started there, we didn't have computers. We had a big TV screen that four of us, we had a, like a number pad and yeah. four of us shared this TV screen, which was connected to the stock exchange. And um, and eventually, I think we got a computer that had email on it and you'd have to go and queue up to send an email. Yeah. <laughs> and, then, um, and, you know, by the time I left, it was, you know, you sat down all day. Mm. If you wanted to send a message to someone or something, a physical piece of paper, you put it in an orange envelope yeah. and put it in a box. And, it, and then someone came and got it and took it to another room where that person was or the next floor down where that where it should be going. So you, yeah. it was kind of, I don't know, have you seen, um, what's that film? There's a, a Disney film with, um, is it Up? It might, no, not Up. The one with the little robot, the cute little robot in. Wally, Wally. Yeah, that one. So like in the second half of that film where there's just people who can hardly walk. Yeah. It all was, it was like that. It was getting that way. <laughs> yeah, I've done lots of jobs where I'm just sat in a chair all day staring at a computer. And, yeah. it, and even when you get your breaks and stuff, you know you should go out. Sometimes you just say, oh, I can't be bothered to just sit in yeah. the chair. It's like, this is not good for me. Yeah. It's easily done. Did you get yeah. any daylight at least, or was it just fluorescent light the whole time? Were you near a window or anything? So when I started, we were on, I think, the sixth floor of a city centre building. Mm. And you could open the windows then. Mm. I can remember that. And then, um, so you, you did get some daylight. I, I was sat by, you know, near enough a window. Mm. And um, sometimes there was one particular seat I had where you, you could see this great big building. You could see these peregrine falcons that nested on there. So that mm. was great. Love that. And then we moved building and it was the building was done up and you were kind of hermetically sealed in. You know, they sealed all yeah. the windows yeah. for air conditioning. You couldn't even get any fresh air. And yeah. um yeah, I just I remember that I'm feeling that's not very good. Yeah. But I've made it a bit of a habit of getting out when I yeah. could. And you know, for my well being. Yeah. And I had a lot of fun getting out of the office every day. And doing doing stupid stuff sometimes, and, and not so stupid stuff. But, um, yeah, I made a project around that for well-being, basically, where mm. I would slip off at lunchtime and mm. like cycle to a vineyard or something, or and come back yeah. without anyone knowing, yeah. with a rucksack full of wine. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, so I, I did all kinds of stuff. Like uh, I went horse riding. And canoeing, yeah, I went canoeing. All in your and, lunch breaks. Yeah, I took an extra <laughs> hour for the horse riding. Right. And you know, more sort of prosaic stuff like just spending time in the market. You know, Kirgate Market. Yeah. Because yeah. it's just, you know, it was it was a polar opposite to sitting in an office all day. You walk yeah. in there and it's full of life, and just exploring Leeds, which is my hometown. I, I found that. Being sat in a chair for all day was brilliant because mm. I could plan all these little um, excursions yeah. and you know I could see for miles and I could think oh I'm gonna I'm gonna go over there today on my bike or yeah jump on a train or something so yeah I did it I turned it into a I started looking forward to going to work for my lunch breaks it's like what am I gonna do today. <laughs> <laughs> so what was the best discovery you made in the city then while you were doing that? Well, it's hard to rank them really, but there was... Um, All right, just some good ones then. Yeah, there's a guy, a guy called Bruce who, who had an art gallery in his house, basement arts project, right? Um, which I'd heard about, I'd read about it on... I did, I did all kinds of research for, for stuff to mm. do. I kind of heard of it, but it's not the sort of thing I would tend to do. Go yeah. to a, 
someone's house and look in their basement. But um, I did. I did. I went a few times, you know, it was great. He put on this sort of contemporary art shows in his basement, um, yeah. local artists and stuff, and he made beautiful cups of coffee. And it was always, you know, it was just, you'd spend all day in the office, in the morning in the office, go yeah. and do something like that. And you'd be totally refreshed. It was like you'd been on holiday or something. Yeah. Yeah. What else? I mean, eating, you know, you could eat a different lunch every day in the market yeah. uh i did things like you know buying buying things from the market and then trying to find someone to cook them for me um <laughs> in the market a lot of cycling seeing how far i could go seeing how yeah. far i could go on the train i got to york one day on the train and back in an hour which was i didn't get to spend it any time in york it was about two yeah. minutes yeah um it was just, you know, it was just kind of breaking that daily fog. Yeah. Um, so every break. day you were doing something different, so it was a different day. It wasn't yeah. every day, but it was kind of, you know, some days I was just like, oh, I can't be asked. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then, then I discovered all these things, all these great things about leads that I didn't know about. All these great people, and then I started inviting them into work. And doing, they were doing some talks. We did like this lunchtime speaker series. So I got people in from like Leeds Bid and East Street Arts and the Basement Arts Project, and an author who was writing a book about the Louis Le Prince, the filmmaker. Yeah. And um, yeah, got a few people in, and that was that was good. And it just sort of opened up my eyes to the city, a city that I thought I knew because I was yeah. born here and lived here pretty much all my life. Yeah. and realise that, you know, I don't really know it. It's kind of criminal, that, isn't it? It's like, you know, we we do, you know, we sort of live here and we don't, we, we think we know certain things about it, but we don't really learn any history about Leeds. You know, you yeah. learn history about London and, yeah. you know, the world or, yeah. you know, parts of English history, but you don't really learn about where you're living. Yeah. Which yeah. you should. And, yeah. And... I think for me, and I don't know if it if it's if it's applicable to anyone else, but for me, it really um, I find it really grounding. Mm. Like, you know, at the moment with I'm I live in Pudsey now, and um, I realised that I knew more about my office in the centre of Leeds and its environs than I than I ever knew about where I live, where I actually live. Mm. Because I was spending pretty much, well, the majority of my working hours there, mm. you know, get up, commute, sit on your ass for eight hours a day or whatever. Mm. And then, um, you know, if you're lucky, you can get out and explore. So, like, for example, now I'm in lockdown in my, in my spare room. I've got, I've got a map on my wall here, yeah. which has my spare bedroom right at the center it's an os map you can get them made and this is what yeah. i did in my previous job i got i got an os map with my swivel chair in the center and then just realize how much stuff is around you to explore yeah i like it nice yeah. idea <laughs> yeah and um, so what so, do you start off with the map then just picking picking things off the legend and go right what's that what's that look like i'm going there um, yeah I kind of yeah. challenge myself. So on the OS map of Leeds City Centre that I had, you know, there was a vineyard in the bottom right hand corner. Mm. I was like, what? I think yeah. I think I'd kind of knew that I'd heard about it, but I thought, can I get there in a lunch break? So I challenged myself to do, you know, see how far I could get or, you know, and make myself go to things, events and stuff that I wouldn't normally go to. But this yeah. kind of project that I gave myself gave me a kind of purpose to do stuff that I wouldn't normally do. You know, put me on a, a new line of interest. Yeah. Um, that kind of has has been, you know, it's got me into this new job. You know, I see it as a development of stuff I was doing then. I was going to say, yeah, it sounds like it's you're kind of building on what you're already doing. So sort yeah. of following your own path and going what will keep me interested, what will keep my brain active, 
and yeah. what, what will benefit me by doing things, having new experiences, and then you've kind of taken that experience into this new role. But then yeah. you've been hit by a global pandemic. So yeah. I suppose yeah. there's a lot, I, I would imagine you had quite a lot of ideas that you wanted to bring into this as well that you couldn't really use at the moment. Have you, did job. you have to do quite a lot? Yeah, have you had to do quite a lot of rethinking, I suppose, because you were interviewed during lockdown. Yeah. You, yeah. you already were prepared for that to a degree. Yeah, well, I guess, I mean, I think they were probably, you know, none of us at that time knew that we'd be still in lockdown, you know, lockdown now. And I, I think, you know, I was being interviewed for a job that wasn't, that was, a face-to-face job, an office-based job that was, you know, I'd be going out and mingling and networking and stuff mm-hmm. in, in person, but that's not happened. So doing it online, that sort of networking and, um, yeah, and, you know, we, we've had to sort of adapt because COVID has affected all a lot of the stuff that is um, integral to the job really and you know adult social care and well-being so are you i suppose it's hard to tell but are you kind of is it making you work more it sounds like there's less to do because there's less going on but then at the same time that could be more to do because you need to find more things but there's less going on so yeah. are you are you busier than you should be or not as busy as you should be um <laughs> It's hard to know because uh, I've only been doing it in this situation. You know, yeah. in lockdown. But, you know, part part of the job is, so because of the CARE Act, there's a lot of information around social care, et cetera, on the, on the website. So there's about 90 odd pages of information which needs to be maintained. Yeah. And that involves, you know, me getting in touch with people who know what they're talking about and who know, you know, maybe regulations or, you know, they've got some sort of intelligence yeah. from from the ground. So there's that, that's going on in the background all the time. You know, these pages need to be, it's on a rolling basis. Mm-hmm. And that's a legal requirement for them to be up to date and accessible so that, you know, any, anyone can access it. And then on the other side, there's the activities, which is kind of, you know, it feeds into the, the information and advice pages as well, because the activities, and a lot of it is about prevention, about trying to give people the advice and the information they need so that people won't become isolated or won't become ill because they're isolated, or at least know where the information is. They can find the information themselves, or someone else can find the information for them regarding health I, I don't know if you would have kind of touched in this area but when we went into the first lockdown there was lots of people doing the you know the hundreds of thousands or whatever it was that signed up for NHS volunteers and so on and a lot yeah. of mutual aid things kind of kicking off do you are you connected to things like that in where you're working or do you know if there's that going on I mean there seems to be I'm I'm extrapolating that in most areas there are some people who are kind of you know whether it's a church group or something like that but that are making an effort to kind of yeah. knock on people and make sure they're at least you know still still kicking around. Yeah, yeah. There's um. So I'm just working on uh, looking at food banks at the moment. Mm-hmm. There's a, f- a few of those and other food kind of options. For people who might be struggling to get out the network the partnership that this website is involved in includes the local voluntary um you know most most cities have a big umbrella voluntary organization yeah. like in leeds it's voluntary action lead so yeah. the equivalent of that and there's loads of these organizations under them as well so there's there's loads of people looking at this yeah my my, my role is essentially just to information on that I'm told to do you know there's also a you know can can we actually drive anything in terms of helping people 
getting them back online with activities, etc. Mm -hmm. And also where, where the authority I work in are big on a thing called asset-based community development. Asset based. Asset, yeah, A W S E T. So A B C D, and that is around looking at what's available in the, you know, wherever you you're looking at in the geography you're looking at, see what assets are there, what what is good, what venues are there, what people are there, yeah, what activities are there, and using what they call a strength based approach to say this is good, you 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 might benefit from this rather than what's been looked at as a deficit-based approach where people would be labelled essentially as, you know, there's something wrong with you. Yeah. Take some pills or go, you know, sort yourself out. <laughs> so the asset-based approach is something I'm really interested in and, you know, sort of community development. Mm -hmm. And obviously that is a challenge at the moment. Mm -hmm. Has there been anything you can get your teeth into in, at the moment then? Anything that you can sort of really get going or any ideas that you've had? So a lot of local authorities have something similar to this mm -hmm. platform, but they, they sort of do it in different ways. Yeah. So the one I'm with are quite big on, you know, putting activities on there, et cetera, and having options for people who are looking for stuff to do for social, for socialization. We're looking at getting some of these things back online and and how to just get an idea of what's happening in the city in terms of are people going to want to put stuff on again? Do, you know, do people think things are going to go back to normal? Mm -hmm. And what do you need in order to do what you were doing previously if you're going to yeah. do it? Yeah. And there's other things as well. As I mean, I, I'm really into workplace well-being I, I find it a fascinating subject you know and people who are in work turn into people who aren't in work at some point whether that's through yeah. retirement or unemployment I think you know there's a big health uh, uh, well-being conversation around work which is becoming more important I think at the moment because work is changing so much I think you mentioned earlier that you know about the, the high street changing and property yeah uh, developers yeah office people who own offices etc must be worrying yeah about their income streams at the moment because you know yeah. it's it being uh, longer it goes on i i mean as much as other customers coming back the you know are the businesses coming back and if the mm -hmm. businesses come back then do the customers come back i mean even when when you have vaccinated people there will be people who you know don't want to come out or can't come out now you know yeah that have spent so long inside that they just die. You know, it's it's a bit of an issue for them to come out. It's a cost saving exercise as well. If you, you know, if you've got people, I know there's been various uh, studies about productivity at home compared to being in the office, but yeah, you know, it saves money on lighting and heat for starters, and um, you know, employers paying their rent, mm -hmm. you know, for for the office. It doesn't save money for the employees for their light and heat. But mm -hmm. something I noticed when I resigned, the first winter after I resigned, I realised that one of the things I really missed was the heating in the office. <laughs> <laughs> Forgotten how cold it was in winter in your own house. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, but you were you were you were lucky you got a decent temperature with it because the, the, you know temperature at work is always a bugbear. There's you know it's right for one in thirty people. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> I'm too hot. I'm too cold. I'm going to open this window. Oh, you can't open the window. I'm going to put a fan on. Yeah. Why are you putting yeah. a fan on? It's freezing. Yeah. Uh, always yeah, fun. There was, yeah. There was about 24 people in the office. So it was like an open plan. It was essentially a call centre. Yeah. Uh, but it wasn't called that officially. Quite a lot of heat came off the photocopier behind me, and, yeah. as well as radiation, I presume. Um, but yeah, I, there was someone who used to sit on a, a hot water bottle because they were so cold. Yeah. But, you know, there was with, a with, range. With three, three jumpers on as well in a scarf. Yeah. <laughs> they, used to, they used to fill the water, water bottle from the kettle and then pour it back, pour it back in to heat it up. <laughs> <laughs> this hot water bottle would be on yeah. all morning. At least it's not wasting the water, I suppose. 
<laughs> it feels like you've got some ideas and there's a bunch of things there that you think in terms of, of well-being or things that you've learned or things that you want to put into practice. Mm. It, it feels like there's something in your head that you, you, you kind of like, I'd really like to talk about this. Yeah. So well, what, that, what would that be? That would be, so I think there is potential for using this asset-based community development thing mm -hmm. for workplace well-being uh, in the corporate world. Mm -hmm. You know, I worked in the corporate world for 20 years and, you know, there were ups and downs. You know, well-being didn't even exist about 10 yeah. years ago, workplace well-being. You know, there was a bit of yoga, but I kind of decided I didn't want to be doing the downward dog with, you know, people who have been sitting with all day. Not that, you know, they were lovely people, but um, yeah. it, it was all very internalised. And I think at the moment you get that, you know, there's corporate talk about community, corporate community, and it's all very inward-looking. It's all within the four walls of, the organization yeah yeah, yeah. it's not outward looking and yeah. i i don't think that is community i think you know co oh, well, corporate it's, culture it's, as well it's more like identity isn't it it's kind of like trying to put a uniform on you to a degree it's yeah. like oh, you know like a team building exercise which i think in a lot of ways are great and it's great to have those social events with colleagues and to actually build better relationships with them and i do think that helps with the working relationships Mm. but it's also kind of like you say that inward focus i think that's a key thing yeah you, you know i think you've got a really good point with that that it is always internally focused and it's just like let's all just spend the rest of our lives together just seeing these people it's like yeah no i don't like <laughs> as much as you're all lovely i don't want to see you all the time like, yeah. you, you do need the mix up and it's and i worked at stockbroker call center they had some some externally focused stuff it was like mm. volunteers that were going out and would do voluntary work yes it seemed to be like quite popular I, I never went on it myself but that, I think that's quite good in terms of like you say getting some external focus because at least you're meeting other people and you you know I, I guess you go with work colleagues but you, you're not just forced to it's not like forced fun you know, yeah. you, you will all go and you will all enjoy and you will all get to know each other and work better mm, yeah so well, any particular ideas of what what they would do or how you would go about that then well so i mean this is like my hobby this is you know thinking yeah. about this sort of stuff and um so i found some research of one particular bit i did like it was called lunch unpacked very nice academic paper on what was it called? It had some really great phrases in it. It was a very academic paper about, you know, regenerating yourself by taking a break mm -hmm. at work. And essentially it said, if it is, if people think they are being made to do something, so if they feel under pressure to take a break and do some yoga or do some mindfulness, it's actually yeah. counterproductive. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the idea is that, you know, as an employee, employer, you know, the more autonomy you can give your employees to do what they want, and that could be something or nothing. You know, if people want to work through the lunch break, or then that may be more beneficial to them than taking a break on that day. Mm. But I think, you know, I, I see a um, maybe a potential for employers encouraging and giving their employees resources and the motivation to to go out and do stuff that isn't premeditated by the employer like you know like csr stuff mm. which part of me thinks it's more for the employer than it is for the employee yeah, um, yeah. and for the shareholders or whatever but oh, for the and then the and the image and you know yeah you are doing these things yeah and, you know, one of the things I noticed when I was working in this office seven floors up was I could see people working all around me in other buildings, mm -hmm. you know, meters away. I have no idea who they were. You know, they were my neighbours for years. And uh, it's just madness, isn't it? It's just ridiculous. I mean, people in the same building, mm. I didn't know, you know, 
it people was... on the so- the same floor sometimes. Yeah. You know, depending on how tight your team is, it's like, you know, if you, I, I've worked in places where you'd just be on a bank of desks and you pretty much won't talk to anybody else on the floor. And yeah. You're just, you know, you're lucky if you talk to anyone on that bank of desks. Yeah. And maybe that's human nature, and you know maybe that's the way things are. But you know, you, you know, you can find your own. You know, given the time and resources to go and find your own kind of tribe in your in your lunch break or whatever, taking breaks, even if it's just lying in the sunshine by the river or something, which you can do in mm. Leeds if you find a nice spot. <laughs> but um, you know, I think I think there's. Leeds is a very, I think you mentioned it on your website about the the industrial past of Leeds, which, you know, I find, I one of the things that I did when I was working as a stockbroker, at one point I thought, how the hell did I get here? You know, mm. I never intended this to happen. And, um, but, and then looking into the history of work in Leeds and the industry, and then seeing a thread, you know, from textiles uh, through to, you know, finance, because Leeds has become that now, hasn't it? Yeah. Fine centre. And a big, big digital sort of cohort as well. And a lot of, yeah. ex- a lot of digital jobs expected and so on. Yeah. But we'll see how that goes. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's always, there's, I, and there's a lot of people that have made, you know, made a lot of money out of Leeds and elsewhere. Mm-hmm. So, you know, there's always people that are doing well here. And it, it's weird that, in a lot of ways, the city should be more famous, more well known, but it's kind of, I don't know. I, I think to some degree, the problem with Leeds is is, is that it's called Leeds. <laughs> now, do, do you know what I mean? It's kind of like the name just, it, we've, we've not quite got the branding right on the name because you just kind of <laughs> don't think about it. You know, you think of the North, you think of Manchester, Liverpool, Newcastle. Right. Uh, now, Leeds will get a sort of, you know, we, we just don't get mentioned as much. I think it's better now than it used to be. Like, we yeah. sort of mentioned more. But, yeah, yeah. I, I, I think we should be more well-known within the country. Right. Personally, I don't know if you would agree. Well, um, yeah. I mean, I, Leeds, someone said to me that they think it's because Leeds is a fairly new, new city. You know, it's not like, well, I suppose Manchester's similar, isn't it? It sort of blew up through the Industrial Revolution. Mm. That's yeah. it. And it's an old market town as well. It's like it's not like, mm. you know, the, the old Cloth Hall and whatever weren't, weren't, didn't draw people in and weren't, weren't busy. Yeah, it wasn't like a tourist attraction that, you know, the Cloth Hall, not like you've been to the Halifax Peace Hall. Yes. Yeah. which is the, an old cloth hall, isn't it? Which is beautiful. And there used to be a cloth hall of similar size to that in Leeds, or a few of them. So there was one on near where I used to work, uh, near City Square. So yeah. where the post office is now, there was a coloured cloth hall. And I used to imagine, you know, if, I, if I'd been born 200 years earlier, would I have been a trader in that cloth hall? Where am I going with this? I have no idea. Well, you were just wondering. Well, I mean, it's the it's the mental sort of journeys that you can take, and when you find things out about an area, you're kind of like, oh, that's interesting. I didn't know this used to be that, or it was yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. You kind of think of yourself in in regards to that. Yeah, that's. I mean, that's another thing about discovering the place you live. You know, you can do it in the present day, or you can dive back into history. One of the things I loved doing was looking at old maps and, you know, discovering what was there before, what was there now. So, you know, where I used to work, it was, you know, I'd look at the geology under the building, you know, or the British Ge- British Geological, I can't remember what they're called, BGS website. Right. You can do kind of synthetic borehole drilling. Uh, right. So you can <laughs> work out, you know, what's what's underneath you and then look into the history and realize that it used to be a, a manorial park where people would hunt and somehow years later you sat there in a swivel chair for eight hours a day trading bits of information <laughs> yeah now, yeah that's what it is i mean that's a i used to, my, my daughter i used to try and explain to her what i did for work 
you know, when she was little. And I said, basically, you know, we, we're just giving people information that they're paying for. You keep some of it, you know, you don't give all of it out because <laughs> that, that would negate your work. Yeah. What did you think of the actual trading then? How did you, I mean, you, you did it for long enough. I mean, was it just the money that kept you there? I mean, you said towards the end, it was kind of like you're thinking that this is quite specialised. How are the skills transferable? transferable? Like, there yeah. must have been a degree to which the job kind of kept you interested to stay there yeah. that long. Yeah, definitely. It was um, it was something I'd never considered. Mm-hmm. Uh, I remember when I went to college and a, a mate saying, let's, let's invest our student loans in the stock market. I was like, what? You know, I didn't even really know what the stock market was. I went to art college and, and did an art degree and did various jobs after that. And then a mate got me a temporary job at this place. But I kind of thought, you know, this is the best thing I could possibly, this is my best option at the moment. Yeah. And it was also, I, I was interested. I wondered what was going on. I, I was curious. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there were some great people who worked there. And I decided that I would knuckle down and, you know, do some exams and mm. see if I could get qualified. Because I'd done various jobs before mm. where I wish I'd have got into it more. I, I, I worked for a mate's dad and he had a metal fabrication company. I kind of wish that I'd done some welding qualifications mm. and I worked in off license and I kind of wished I'd done some wine qualifications in mm. retrospect. So, um, you know, I decided I'd uh, just kind of put my mind to it, but it was hard. I did some exams and they were, you know, they were pretty tough. Well, they were very tough. Um, you know, I was kind of pleased that I passed them and became a qualified, I became a chartered something. Mm. And um, it just became kind of like I was on, on autopilot. Yeah. But it was also very draining because you had to be on the ball yeah. because, you know, like if you're writing something on, you, you know, on a word document and you make a spelling mistake, put yeah. a full spin or it doesn't really matter. But if you're doing, if you're buying yeah, you know, yeah. 20,000 pounds worth of shares or 200,000 pounds worth of shares. Or 2 million the, pounds. <laughs> or a million, yeah. Putting the dot in the wrong place. Yeah, you know, making a mistake can have. Yeah, because once you press that button, yeah, you know, it's done. But yeah, it was it, it was fascinating as well. You know, you know, seeing things like the financial crash mm. and the dot com boom, mm. you know, happening. So where did you come into that then? We, did you so ninety seven that you'll have just well, it would have been before it even started to tick up, wouldn't it? It'd be like, uh, for before that started properly. If that's going yeah, to be what, 99, 98 for the dot com. Yeah, it kind of blew up around 2000, mm. but it was happening. You know, it was it was gradually yeah. happening, and I think that's how I basically got. Well, it's also because a lot of mutual there were demutualizations. You know, like the building yeah. societies. Yeah, yeah. And there were nationalizations of the utilities around. You know, still happening around that time, and that just pulled in a lot of people who would probably not, you know, that that was kind of a, a conservative, it was a Thatcherite thing, wasn't it, to try and get everyone involved in shareholder yeah, capitalism. Yeah. You know, you, you asked me what I wanted to do as a kid earlier, and I, I asked that same question to some of my colleagues, and, you know, at least one of them wanted to be a stockbroker when they were about four. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> But, you know, that's because it, it became, I suppose, you know, it made some people quite wealthy those times and introduced people to, you know, it, it was totally alien to me. Mm. Fascinating at the same time. And, you know, I learned a lot. I did. It, it could be a bit like a fruit machine watching the stock market in 2000 when the dot-com boom was happening. It was crazy, you know, you know, just figures, share prices going up and then dropping like a stone, mm. et cetera. And, you know, you kind of think, I tell you, one, of, one of the most enlightening things for me, which shows my naivety, was I think it was a company called WPP. They, right, yeah. uh, that was um, Martin Sorrell's advertising company. Yeah. 
and uh, they put out, you know, companies would put out these announcements before the stock market opened, and they said they were cutting so many thousand jobs. And, you know, naive me thought, oh, that's terrible. That's going to be terrible for the company and for the share price. And the market opened and the share price just went up and up like this. And it, just, it was a real revelation for me thinking, what? Yeah. because it's all about humans at the end of the day mm. and work and, you know, people working for other people and group behavior what... and group, group dynamics. Do you yeah. partake yourself? Did, did it ever tempt yeah. you? Yeah, I, I had some successes and some terrible unsuccesses, whatever the word for that is. You know, ten, in the stock market, people will tend to tell you about the successes. Most people, I mean, you've got to be very lucky to, if you're a trader, I mean, you know, there are day traders and there are investors. Yeah. Um, so investing is a sort of long-term thing. But it was, you know, I'm not a gambling man, but I became one. Uh, yeah, yeah. And then I stopped being one. But yeah, it was, you know, it was very kind of enticing around the dot com mm-hmm. room where you were seeing people buying and selling things within minutes sometimes. Yeah. For a profit. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, going from not being very money motivated mm-hmm. at all uh, to being kind of like, you know, there's so much to be made. It's so easy. Yeah, yeah. Is there anything else that you want to touch on? Is there anything that we haven't really covered? I mean, I'd like, I'd quite like to get your ideas on sort of going forward, your ideas for the future. Like, do you, you know, do you sort of see us coming out of this? Do you see well-being becoming something that comes to the fore? I'd also like to kind of touch upon, you know, for yourself working from home and well-being like do you still get to sort of think about um your own well-being and how you can increase your well-being or is it just a matter of i'm working from home i'm just on the zoom and available and i go for walks when i can um like how are you dealing with that and is that giving you ideas for new things in terms of well-being mm. there's a lot there sorry yeah <laughs> I'll try and yeah. remember them if we, if you can remember any of them, then we'll just sort of <laughs> chat about that, and then I'll try and come back to them if I remember them. Okay, yeah, yeah. Working from home and the well-being thing, and going for walks is essentially what I've been doing. And you know, I went up the local hill today with a flask of tea, which was rank. It was, I've, I've not really made tea in a flask before, but yeah. I think it'll be the last time. It'll be soup. But anyway, so the local hill, you can get a really good view. And yeah, that's the sort of stuff I like doing. You know, walking is is fantastic. It's a fantastic kind of well-being thing. But it's not easy, is it? I mean, it's um, I think it's a struggle to some extent working from home. And, yeah. you know, I'm struggling with it sometimes. And I don't know. I don't know. I'd learned in the stock market that... You shouldn't try and guess the future. And yeah, I can't even imagine really, because I wouldn't like to guess when we'll come out of lockdown or what it'll be like. But just being able to go and see people would be a amazing, wouldn't it? Or go to the pub, like we said yeah. earlier. But I think the world of work is changing massively. I do think yeah. you know, like there's some companies coming out like Unilever said recently that they they wouldn't be expecting they don't expect any of their employees to come back into the office full time. Yeah. Um, have they said they're moving into a four day week? I know some sure. said someone did. I can't remember who it was, but I know a big one. Like, yeah. But at least considering it. Yeah. I think that, you know, those kind of things are really interesting and I like the sound of it because mm. I think there's been various studies that show again about product productivity. People can do the same amount in a four-day week as they do in five. It's just, you know, the work's there. The people give people a bit less time to do it so they can have a three-day weekend um, because, you know, the type of work we're doing is changing, isn't it? It's kind of, it's not as quantitative mm. as it could be. Um, you know, like when our ancestors, I don't know about yours, but, my ancestors in Leeds were probably sat in 
their living room or bedroom with a loom, you know, 300 years ago, which, is, you know, I feel like I'm doing that now a bit. You know, yeah, so, yeah. But at least, you know, they knew they had to do a certain, you know, they probably had a certain amount of work to do. And, mm. and now it's a bit less, you know, my job is, it's rolling. It's, it, I'm not producing anything tangible. Yeah. And I wasn't doing in my previous job. So it's a bit more amorphous, isn't it, work? It's becoming, for some people, not for everyone, it's a bit more nebulous what we're actually doing. Yeah. Is that no, that, that's, no, that doesn't make sense. I mean, a lot of my job, because I've done a lot of office jobs and admin roles and so on, um, you are a lot of the time about, what, what do I do? I mean, that time that I spent at the TUC, I really felt like, you know, most of the time I was just sort of sat in a chair waiting for the phone to ring, sending emails or whatever, not really doing anything. And then I would go through and sort of, you know, oh, I worked on this project and I did this project and I did this event. And, I did, you know, when I wrote it down, it was like, oh, God, I did loads of stuff there. You know, like I was there for a long time and I had a lot of freedom within that role to get involved in various yeah. things. But, you know, at the time, because the majority of the job seemed to be, you know, going in, going into that chair, seeing that screen and seeing the people around me, it seemed like that was all I did. But when I actually <laughs> sort of thought about it and went through what I did do, there was loads of stuff. Yeah. I don't know why. Oh, yeah. So it's talking about the jobs being nebulous and so on. But, yeah, you don't really know what you do. It's not like, you know, you, if, you, if you're moving Earth, for example, and you move it from one side to the other you know how much earth you've moved you know how much work you've done you know yeah. the physical act has taken place whereas if you just send in emails and like even especially so i've done a bunch of social media posting recently mm. and you kind of and it's like marketing i know i mean and i know like you know people will go into lots of detail and study this that and the other about marketing but it is also just throwing a lot of mud at the wall and seeing what sticks um, mm, yeah. you know, there's loads of research there's loads of you know knowledge and papers and time and study and information behind it all but in a lot of ways it is also just throwing a lot of stuff and making a lot of noise and hoping that it works you know you yeah. can't you can't li you, you can't make someone buy a thing or go to a place mm. you know, you, you're very subtle and kind of suggest but you can't just you know, you can't guarantee that they will buy the thing. Yeah. That makes sense. I mean, you can lean them towards it in a lot of ways, but yeah, to directly do something that you want is, is difficult sometimes. Mm. I've just been watching, um, I think I'm about halfway through a film called The Social Dilemma, on uh, which uh, is yeah. about that very thing, you know, how some of the big tech companies, they they seem to think they can... Nudge. No, no, yeah, nudge and um, influence. Well, you know, it, it seems to be that they can, you know, in, in in certain things. I mean, I'm I'm quite keen on buying a pair of slippers at the moment because it's freezing in my house and I've got floorboards and I've never, you know, I've never really. I don't think I bought a pair of slippers for myself ever, but I think I was thinking about it. And you know, before I know it, there's a pair of slippers on my phone. Um, on the on the you know, when I was looking through the newspaper, yeah, and watching this social dilemma thing, I'm uh, you know, I'm all, I've always been pretty skeptical about big business, mm. um, but you know, it's making me think a bit about you know, not going on Instagram so much or Twitter. <laughs> Have you been able to keep for yourself then a, a work? A work-life balance. A work-life balance, right. Yeah, okay. for yourself. Have you been able to through the lockdown? Yeah. Or is it just kind of all blended into one? Of just, you know, uh, are, you, are you kind of working whenever or are you keeping the kind of your hours? Yeah. Well, I, it's flexible. My, mm. You know, I've got flexibility of working between 7 in the morning and 7 at night. And I've experimented with that. Mm. Um, but I do tend to revert to type, you know, like nine to five sort of thing. And work-life balance, I, I find that, I, I, I love that phrase because it, it kind of suggests that work is one thing, life is another, and they both kind of balance somewhere. Mm. But, you know, work is part of life, isn't it? It's, it's you know, life's the big thing. 
and then you've got work in there. But I have, I think I've struggled with it in the past, where it, it kind of, where work seeped into my life mm. without me wanting it to, like the stress of work, say my last job, you know, it was mm. quite fresh. It did become quite debilitating. I, I kind of burnt out mm. internally, but I still did the job. But mm. I would, one of the reasons why I started doing the exploring and stuff was to try and balance out my work, you know, find a life because work was kind of, you know, pretty busy and full on. And I was also a shared parenting dad, so a dad, half-time dad. Yeah. Um, so half the week. So it felt like I didn't have much time for myself, but I found out that lunch breaks were an hour of, of pure me time. So I, I use that kind of thing now to try and balance work with life <laughs> you know by doing doing stuff and like I mentioned before you know do, having these little excursions and mm -hmm. trying to find new stuff to bring you out of that autopilot type mm -hmm. work thing which happens you know, I think it I think it's quite a, it happens to people you know you're doing the same thing every day mm -hmm. It might not be exactly the same, but it's quite easy to fall into a kind of, you know, blinkered. Yeah, yeah just the road routine. Yeah. It's going through the motions. Yeah. So, Are you quite, yeah. in, in terms of the way that you work or the way that you think about work, I mean, you don't sound like a live to work sort of person, more, more work, um, work to live. Work um, to live, yeah. Yeah. Do you see it as like sort of necessary toil or... You know, are you one of these, if you're doing something that you enjoy, you'll never work a day in your life? Like, yeah. is work to you, is is it just something that you, I mean, it's obviously not something that you kind of just go into and leave at home, because given the role that you've gone into and that it's within your interest and you're specifically sort of in an area you wanted to be in. Yeah. Now. But I mean, sort of your traditional attitude to work, I would imagine it's fluctuated. Mine definitely has, like what work yeah. is and how I view work. But would you say your overriding thing is that it's just kind of something that's necessary, or do you mm. do you do you see active value in work for its own sake as well? Mm. Well, let me think about that. I see work. If I didn't, if I was rich, or if I I've got a mate who I was talking to the other day who he, he's a writer now. I was saying, you know, your your lifestyle sounds pretty good. And he, he said, well, if you're happy living on the poverty line, then, mm. and I've realised that I'm not happy living on the poverty line. You know, I want to pay my bills and my mortgage and everything. But also, you know, there's a thing about having a sense of purpose as well, isn't it? And mm -hmm. whatever that may be. What are you hoping for? this year then from this role is there a, like is there anything that you can realistically sort of like goals you can set yourself and achieve and so on with with this at the moment as it is or is it more of a carry on with what you're doing and wait until hopefully lockdown ends um well my immediate uh wish is for my contract to get extended beyond the end of march which is when it uh, is officially ends but hopefully it'll get extended yeah. and um, and then see what happened you know see how things progress if we if and when when we come out of lockdown mm. um you know i want to learn more about this asset-based community development and the thing that they have as well called local area coordinators which the people on the ground mingling in the community yeah, I mean, I think work's changing. I think society's changing. Mm. You know, austerity and COVID, you know, things are changing. And climate change. Climate change, yeah. A lot of changes coming up.
Yes, things are changing. Soon the pubs will be open again, not that I can go. Next time on Working Hours, we'll be heading into the world of TV researching. If you liked this episode, then I do hope you come back for more. And if you would like to hear more from my discussion with this particular guest, then there's over half an hour of bonus material that will be going up shortly for any subscribers to this show's Patreon. If you got any value from listening to this, then please do consider doing the old like, share and subscribe thing. Working Hours is now available wherever you get your podcasts, except YouTube, but I'm working on that. If you're listening to this on Apple, then obviously if you can write a good review for us, then that would be lovely. And more importantly, it would really be very, very much appreciated. Okay, so let's really hammer the message of this show home now with some sort of rule-based mnemonic. So... First rule of working hours is if you're a loiner or if you know a loiner, then you must tell the loiner about working hours. Second rule of working hours is that if you're a loiner, then you really should like and subscribe to the show. The third rule of working hours is that if you're a loiner, then you really ought to be my guest. And the fourth rule of working hours is that if you work, maybe you should agitate, educate, organize and democratize your workplace. If you're a loiner, then seriously, please, please be my guest on the show. Hashtag be my guest leads. Hashtag working hours leads. If you're a loiner or if you know a loiner, as I said, get in touch or tell them to get in touch. And hashtag tell me about it leads. What do you do leads? Tell me about it. Go to western-studios.com for more information or just email workinghourspod at western-studios.com with a brief bio and some suggestions regarding your availability. Please let me know if you would wish to be anonymous on the show. If you would like to take part but you don't want to be identified, then you can send me a secure email to westernstudios at protonmail.com. Don't want your interview published right away? Fine, we can do that. You will have approval on what gets published from your interview. You can follow this show on Twitter at Western Studios 2 and on Instagram at Western underscore Studios underscore Leads. You can support the show with a one-off donation either to Kofi, that's K-O hyphen F-I dot com forward slash working hours or via buymeacoffee.com forward slash Western Studios where you can give as much or as little as you like. If you'd really like to help out, then you can give the show regular support and help build the project and help us in meeting the goal of lasting out this decade. Subscriptions for Loiners are a pound a month. Go to www.patreon, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash working hours pod to become a regular supporter. If you're not from Leeds and you would still like to support this show, you can join the Outlander level for five pounds a month. That's it. Now go do one amazing thing today. Western Studios Leeds Limited. It is presented and produced by Simon Treen. This interview was recorded over Skype. Thank you to Captivate.fm for podcast hosting. The Working Hours theme was provided by Australian-based loiner DJ Punk. You can hear more from Punk at soundcloud.com forward slash big time punk. If you're in Leeds and have a podcast idea that you would like to develop, please email makemypodcast at western-studios.com with some details about what you would like to achieve and let's start making your podcast a reality today. Follow Western Studios on Twitter, Instagram and linkedin.com forward slash company forward slash western-studios for sporadic news on new episodes of Working Hours and for new original podcast productions that will be coming soon from Western Studios Leeds.